The afternoon of June 29, she and Jane arrive in New York after a seemingly endless flight. After what happened at Horizon, planes now scare her. She had dreamed so many nights of planes flying into buildings. She imagines the pilot struggling to regain control as it plunges towards a building. Then, what? A sudden blackness or a sudden light? She tries not to think about it, but it keeps rising back up. Everything astonishes Jane. The crowds, the traffic, the shops, the shining skyscrapers. She tells Columbia she's hardly ever been away from her parents' farm in Australia, except to go to Horizon. Nothing like this. On the plane, Jane had hinted of a family connected to European royalty, dispossessed in the last century, in hiding or thrown away. She doesn't believe it. Jane's just a dingo. But when Jane says... We've learned to be wary, she reconsiders. Jane's certainly an expert at that. New York, Manhattan Island, is burning in the summer heat. They're driven through the valleys of skyscrapers, the city around them smelling of cars and strange food and hot concrete. As they approach their hotel on the southern tip of the island, the car crawls carefully through crowds that pack the streets and nearby waterfront. Onlookers, the curious, protesters, held back by police. The protesters' signs tell her nothing. No to a dinu. Hospitals, not pleasure palaces. Their driver tells them not to leave the hotel. You can't tell what the protesters might do, he adds. The terror of that night on the roof washes back over her. With nothing to do but wait in their hotel room, Jane orders absurd amounts of food for their dinner. All expenses paid, so why not? More like a last meal, she thinks, and loses her appetite. Instead, she lies on the bed and studies the map of Adinu, looking for whatever it is about the place that has drawn the crowds and incited threats and protests. Judging by the map, Adinu seems to be a city in the making, an oval area of land five miles long, three miles across, like an island. Somewhere outside New York, maybe, or even an actual island in the sea. She can't tell. Streets crisscross Idinu, irregularly carving it into blocks and triangles and diamonds. Some of the blocks are drawn as having buildings. Others are shown as parks. There's woodland, too. A stadium, a water park, two concert halls, museums, countless restaurants, hotels, theatres. A broad river courses through the centre of Adinu, with bridges thrown across it every few blocks. Some spindle-thin for people on foot, others more substantial and intended for vehicles. She can't imagine how Adinu could possibly be an abomination. What about it could create such anger? The threat of violence hangs over everything, and that night she and Jane can't sleep. Instead, they watch the news see the pictures of the gathered crowds, hear the speculation. Idinu is a moving island, or it's under the sea, or deep underground, or is a city under a dome. Through the night they discuss how they must have at every moment a plan to escape, a route away, to save themselves if there's an attack. The signal they decide to use to trigger their escape is bad, short and clear. Say it, shout it, scream it, telephone it, text it. But, she thinks, if it's anything like that airplane, there won't be any escape. Barely enough time to scream it. A note is delivered to their room with breakfast. They are to assemble at nine in the hotel atrium for a presentation, followed by transport to Edinu. As they wait for the presentation, there's the scent of coffee and a whispered tension. There must be 500 people there, she figures, maybe more, plus photographers and news cameras. She and Jane edge up close to a raised platform, keeping close to an emergency exit, behind which is a giant window looking over the harbour towards the Statue of Liberty. At nine exactly, a man walks onto the stage. He's dressed in a silver suit, a silver peaked cap. Under the cap there's a long face on a narrow head, barely wider than his neck, a tall, skinny body, limbs that move unevenly, 
as if poorly connected to that body. Some people clap, but nobody seems quite sure what to do. I am one of the controllers at Adinu, he announces, and I am delighted to welcome you to Adinu. Adinu. Where? Columbia looks around. Where is it? Adinu, the controller continues, seemingly oblivious to the fact that there's nothing there but the hotel atrium and hundreds of waiting people. Idinu is one of the most extraordinary works of mankind, the product of astonishing imagination combined with a triumph of engineering. It is, in short, one of the modern wonders of the world. The first of a modern seven wonders of the world. After Idinu will come another six wonders, each of which will be as remarkable as Idinu, some even more so, all in very different ways. There's a thrill of excitement around the atrium. That's it, then, that mysterious project they had all heard about, the number seven. Seven projects, seven wonders. Idinu is the first of seven modern wonders. And she'll be there, at least at the first one. And surely, oh God, surely seven of these wonders would produce answers, maybe many answers. She tests herself quickly, but she isn't sure she can remember many of the original and ancient seven wonders of the world. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon, for sure. Maybe the Taj Mahal, though that was probably later. Then one of the big pyramids in Egypt, the lighthouse at Alexandria, or maybe it was the library, the Colossus of somewhere. But that was about it, and they were all gone except for bits of the big pyramid she can't recall. She can't imagine what a modern seven wonders would be. The controller keeps talking. Let me tell you about Idinu. It's five miles long and three miles across. There are six hotels that can house 2,000 guests. A thousand more people will live on Adinu permanently, and there will also be nearly 1,000 controllers and staff on Adinu. Beautiful parks, gardens, forests, a river, countless amusements and restaurants. It is, it will be, the most perfect place on earth. It sounds amazing, she thinks, but where is it? And did I mention, the controller says casually, throw away, as if it's of little importance. Idinu flies. There's a gasp. The long-faced controller turns to the window and gestures out eastwards towards the harbour. There's the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, some ships, another island beyond that, nothing unusual, nothing in the sky. But then she sees something moving on one of the islands, rising slowly, then it's clear it's the entire island rising out of the sea, an island that must be three or four miles across. The island sloughs off the sea water in great cascades as it rises, higher then higher, 500 feet above the sea, then a thousand, then stopping at 3,000. Finally, hovering above the harbour, a giant black disc above the Statue of Liberty. Then Idinu moves towards them. In the atrium, people jostle to get a better view. Within minutes, the black disc fills the sky above New York, casting a vast shadow down on them. Millions of lights illuminate the bottom of Idinu, blinking in fast-changing geometries as giant flashlights play down over New York and the harbor. Like some alien spaceship, she thinks. Now there are fireworks shooting up from the ground and a sieve in reply, shooting down towards them from Adinu. She grips Jane's arm. The news cameras are pointing out of the window up at Adinu. People are taking photographs, shouting, laughing. She can hear cheering from the crowds outside the hotel. Ladies and gentlemen, calls out the controller loudly, here is Adinu, the first wonder of the modern world, millions of times larger than the next largest man-made object that can move billions of times larger than the next largest machine that can fly, and yet we simply disguised it during construction by making it look like an island. She's awestruck, amazed. She feels faint. Jane is overwhelmed, mouth open, her camera hanging loose on her wrist. Idinu is lifted by over 200,000 helium compartments. A helium generation plant on Idinu provides additional helium to compensate for seepage and there is a nuclear power plant that provides all the power for Adinu. 
including the power for the 300 impulsion fans that control its flight path. Idinu will usually fly at no more than 2,000 feet and has a maximum speed of 60 miles an hour, though we expect we will normally travel on the winds. Idinu will travel the world, visiting the most remarkable places. The pyramids, the Alps, the Pacific Islands, the North and South Poles, the deserts, the great cities. She shakes her head. It's too incredible. Now, he tells them, it only remains for you to go aboard a dinu and live upon this wonder for yourself. You'll be transported by helicopter and the time of your departure is posted on the screens at the back of the atrium. There's a thunder of applause and a sudden press of people towards the back of the atrium as the strange-looking controller leaves the stage. She can't move. She can't stop looking at it. She can only imagine the city on the top side of Edinu, the buildings and parks and rivers. How extraordinary that must be. A van takes them to the helipad. Approaching it, she can see the sky above them is already filled with a fleet of helicopters heading to Edinu. In the van across from her is an old man in a red suit, an oddly reconstituted Abraham Lincoln, wearing a red bowler hat and carrying a red walking stick, restless in his seat, smiling and pointing. He looks like a person that someone invented to add to the strangeness of the situation. He introduces himself to her as Miami Bonus, of Miami Bonus Amusement Parks. He tells her loudly that they're famous in California. She doesn't know them, she apologizes, and he tells her jauntily that she would if she lived in California. Of course it's the theory of pretty at work again, but for some reason she likes this peculiar old man. He seems safe, like Abraham Lincoln, and knowing that anything might happen on a dinu, she figures it's best to get to know some people. There's a sudden banging on the side of the van, a protester striking the van time and time again with his sign, selfish and soulless, until it breaks apart in his hands and policemen pull him away. The protester, she notices, is dressed in black with a red bandana, the code of the arch. Of course they would be here, she thinks. Such useless anger, says Miami, sadly it seems to her. She doesn't know how much to tell him, what she had seen of the arch, the immoderata, Krieg and Martyr. They're dangerous, Columbia replies simply. Miami shakes his head. No, not dangerous. They lack willpower. They don't want to harm people. They just want to scare people away from these places. He uses a hand to describe a plane in flight, suddenly swerving to avoid the back of the seat in front of him. It seems to perfectly describe what happened on the roof back at Horizon. They did that to you too, with the plane? she asks. He nods, smiles. It was a scare for sure, but no harm done. Never been that close to a plane without sitting in it. But I'm made of tough, scrawny old stuff. I don't scare easy. I guess you don't either. At the helipad, away from the crowds and protesters, they're helped into a helicopter. She's never been in one before, and as they lift off, it's an extraordinary sensation. The steady vibration, energy overcoming gravity and lifting them upwards. Then moving slowly through the sky, the world falling away beneath them, and a dinu filling the sky above, lit in its ever-changing patterns, almost as big as the city that it's floating above. Soon the skyscrapers of New York are far below, rising like glass reeds. In a moment the theory of falling is in her head. One, it's fast. You fall fast. It's over quickly. Even from this high up, you could hold your breath the whole way down, and you would hold your breath. Two, the land and sky would spin around you, confusing you completely. You might not even understand you were falling. Three, your body would be expecting a splash into water. That's what you're used to when you fall. But instead there'd be this crash you'd never hear. She wonders how such terrible thoughts come so suddenly to her. But Idinu is breathtaking, so close now. 
and she knows she's made the right choice to ignore the warning of Krieg and Marta. She knows with conviction that this extraordinary new world will have answers for her.